Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to City Seminar, co-hosted by the Martin Center in the Department of Architecture and the Department of Geography at the University of Cambridge. This year, we are bringing together academics, practitioners, and students to talk about the theme of urban skills in contemporary placemaking. Uh, today, we are delighted to welcome Professor Sophia Sara to join us and share with us her exploration on the skills of awareness as an interlaced social, cultural, and spatial network. I will start with a short introduction of Professor Sophia Sara, and Sophia will give us her presentation following the Q&A session hosted by me and my co-convener, Karam. If anyone have any questions along the talk, please write it down in the chat box, and we are happy to address it afterwards. So um, Sophia Sara is Professor of Architecture and Spatial Design at the Butler School of Architecture, UCL. Her research focuses on spatial morphology in relation to the histories of buildings and cities that have influenced their development alongside the social patterns of human activity and, social, and cultural meaning. She's the author of The Venice Variations, Architecture and Narrative, and the editor of the production size of architecture. Her book, The Venice Variations, explores cities and buildings as multi-authored processes of formation alongside authored projects of design intention. She is the convener of the Parliament Buildings Conference. She has collaborated with and received research funding from leading institutes in the UK and the US. Her architectural work has been exhibited internationally in European and the Venice Biennale. Sophia is the Director of History and Theory PhD program at the Butler School of Architecture and has taught undergraduate and graduate studios and seminars at the Butler University of Michigan, Cardiff University and the University of Greenwich. Now I will pass the screen to Sophia and Sophia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yifei. Thank you, Karam, for inviting me. This is a very fascinating topic, uh, cities and guilds in place making. So I will share my screen. Can you see it? Yeah, we can yes, see it. We can see it. And then go to um, show, um, slideshow, okay, from start. Okay, can you see it all right now? Great, excellent. So the title of the talk is The Venetian Experience, The Tradesmen, The State, The Successors and Our Challenge. It's largely based on the book that I uh, did uh, called The Venice Variations by UCL Press. Uh, it's the first uh, press in the United Kingdom that pioneered an open access uh, publication system and you can download a free PDF from the website of UCL Press. Uh, what we see here in the opening slide is the famous painting of Gentile Bellini. It was commissioned for the Grand Hall of, for the Scuola of uh, the San um, Evangelista, Giovanni Evangelista, uh, the set of the eponymous Brotherhood in Venice. In the foreground, Gentile has painted the confraternity, the guild, in its white robes, processing at the head of the parade in the Piazza San Marco. They have a large golden relic quarry suspended between them, carried beneath a canopy held by four more scholar members. So guilds were very instrumental in medieval, early and late Renaissance cities, but started to decline from the 16th century onwards. For Richard McKerney, the reason for this was that they uh, possessed a lot of professional secrets, uh, which denied them access to the expanding markets. And they were gradually outflanked by merchant capital. And it's a useful observation from which to view processes such as capital accumulation and state formation. In medieval Venice, guilds function in a sovereign state and in a highly commercialized economy. As McKinney explains, this unusual pattern of coexistence did not exist in other cities, Italian city states, or other uh, city states um, in other European countries. Um, but Venice presents a unique case for political and commercial domination of the Eastern Mediterranean because Venice was a maritime republic, meant that from uh, the outset there was a very strong collaboration between the merchant class 
and the producers. Um, there was no division, therefore, strong division between capital and labor. Uh, the Venetian economy depended more on manufacture than, um, um, sorry, more on commerce than manufacture. So the world of guilds in Venice had three major geographical locations, which we see here, I've circled them on the map of Venice. The Arsenale, you see my cursor, which is here, where the Venetian Republic manufactured, manufactured ships, and this was its naval base. The Rialto, which is here, the mercantile center of Venice, which was site of banks, of workshops, of stalls, and massive buildings. And one of the most impressive buildings is the um, Fondaco de Tedeschi, which was the German trading headquarters. And a myriad of tongues were spoken in uh, Rialto, which really shows the outreach of Venetian trade. The third site was the Piazza San Marco, which is here, uh, the site of the Doge's Palace and the Basilica of St. Mark. And this was the center of religious, religion and politics, the focus on the Venetian patricians that were the regulators, regulated all the statues that uh, were used in the operation of the guilds. So in a way, the, the three sides here, the three sides here in the Piazza San Marco was the mediator between the other two. The Piazza San Marco, the Rialto and the Arsenale were all reconfigured in the 16th century. And this was the time that the city really reorganized its ideology and grafted on the medieval urban fabric, um, this ideology uh, of a city that consisted of spaces that looked like Roman uh, fora, like Roman agoras. Uh, and although these three key sites were key places where guilds concentrated, the work and the life of the guildsmen were spread throughout the city. And this is what I'm going to explore. So Venice was dominated by these two institutions, the arte or the guild and the scuola. And the arte using uh, McKinney's uh, definition were free association of laymen and federations of related trades who acknowledged a common identity as townsmen, as practitioners of the same trade, as spiritual brothers. They were the component parts of the medieval city-state, regulating markets, electing councillors, offering aid, some material and some spiritual to their members. The scuola uh, was a devotional confraternity. It was something like a social club or a social organization of guildsmen, joined together by the principle of caritas or charity and love between equals, a practice in philanthropy. It was often associated with an occupational group, which but many other occupational groups could actually be in the composition of a scuola, and which meant that they included members from other trades, and they transcended the boundaries of craft of or parish. Uh, the scuola existed for banqueting, election of the representatives, the distribution of alms, and the provision of burial. Uh, it was a purely religious organization, its members linked by ties of brotherhood, grouped around a cult of a saint, a particular nation, and a cult of the Eucharist. And a guild could establish a scholar, but a scholar could not establish a guild, so that was the difference. Here are some, uh, some uh, uh, examples of guilds where we can see their composition and we can see how they subdivided into other guilds. So for example, the Guild of the Painters, the Pintori, consisted of painters of shields, of saddlers, of chests, of pictures, of furniture. And what did guilds do? Guilds organized the production of goods which could sold in exchange of food. They organized the production of clothing, uh, the building of houses, they regulated the markets around which urban communities had grown up. They often gave shape to political life through the merchants and later the craftsmen who sat on city councils. Moreover, they established aid schemes for members, conviviality at an annual banquet, where they elected their officials as well. Modest financial of illness or accident, commemoration of the dead, and frequently played a distinctive part in the city's cultural life by participating in the rituals, which is what I showed in the first slide uh, through the painting of Gentile Bellini. Their embeddedness in the production of the city, its geography, its architecture, its social organization, its economy, and its politics suggest that they should be studied in conjunction with all these factors. Such communities were especially prominent in medieval Europe from Flanders through Germany and into Northern Italy. But the distinctive features of Venice were 
that the, Venice was a particular urban economic and political environment which had a strong sense of sovereignty. And another distinctive feature was the unique stability of the city that was explained as a perfect political institution. What is known as the myth of Venice by anthropologists and geographers. It, was capt it captivated European thought, the myth of Venice, and powered the development of European political ideas of republicanism. Venice was not affected by the rebellions that shook other cities, other city states in Italy or Northern Europe. In fact, it witnessed nothing more serious than two isolated riots by arsenal workers and the legal disputes of guilds and government. And here we see the guilds of candle makers, glass blowers, and the guilds of the doctors. A particular expression of the myth of Venice is seen in this woodcut by Jacopo de Barbari, um, which shows an aerial perspective of the city from a very unusual position, a position that nobody could actually occupy at that point in time because there was no aerial photography. Uh, it's a view located above San Giorgio Maggiore, which is uh, down here in the island of San Giorgio Maggiore. It is framed by the mountains of the mainland here and by its many islands. And it sits serene in the protection of the lagoon and is portrayed as a thriving metropolis uh, secured in this protected environment. And there are several mythological figures that represent certain qualities and properties that Venice had, such as Neptune who presides in front of the Piazza San Marco and expresses Venice as an empire. Mercury, who is positioned above the Rialto and expresses the commercial dimensions of the city. And there are some um, wind gods that blow favorable, favorable winds towards the galleys of Venice and expresses um, the strength and power of Venice as a maritime republic. There's another very important characteristic that perhaps we cannot grasp uh, when we look at this woodcut on our screens. We have to see it in its um, uh, real dimensions because it was a large um, print and people had to walk along it in order to really observe in extraordinary amount of detail uh, the houses, the neighborhoods, uh, the squares, the churches with their bell towers and even the wellheads at the center of the churches. That extraordinary amount of detail celebrates the beauty and the complexity of the Lagoon City and that was part of Venice's myth. But this myth was not simply the beauty of the urban landscape or the economic and the imperial power of the city, but it was also the strength and the uniqueness of the institutions. It had its origins in a group of folk beliefs and legends, which in the 16th century were reconfigured and were transformed to official um, historiography by a group of humanists, such as uh, Gasparo Contarini and Paolo Paruta, who explained that this was one of the political institutions in the world. And historians have looked at many explanations of this Venetian stability. And by Venetian stability, we mean that Venice remained inviolate for 1,000 years and didn't have these kinds of riots that really shook the other cities, city states. And uh, these um, explanations have been grouped in several categories. So there is the geographical explanation in the sense that Venice did not have um, a, a, co a, a contest between a feudal mobility and the city, like other cities, because it was <clears throat> founded in water. It didn't have a hinderland. There is an explanation about the topographical location, in the sense that the water protected the city and Venice did not need to actually build defensive walls around it, like other cities. There is the economic explanation, um, because it was deprived of land, it was the city deprived land as a source of wealth and naturally to sea and to commerce. And the ruling class in Venice was a class of rich merchants and the government made it a point to protect the interests of these merchants. Unlike other city states, there wasn't a particular stigma associated with the nobility uh, engaging in trading in Venice. <clears throat> Another explanation is that the city's merchant patricians were engaged in overseas trade which distanced them from geographically, economically, and politically from the world of the craftsmen and the producers in the city itself. 
And there is another one which uh, suggests uh, that um, Venice had socially heterogeneous neighborhoods that mitigated class tensions between wealthy people and uh, poor people, as well as government enforced institutions, uh, such as civic rituals, which enabled broad participation and gave people a stake, at least at this symbolic level, in terms of the representation of the strength and the power of the city. Historians have also looked at various institutions in order to understand the cohesion of the Venetian society and the myth of Venice. And in his work, Rich and Poor in Renaissance Venice, Brian Pullen has called attention to the role played by this institution, the Scuole Grande. There were six powerful and well-endowed religious confraternities. Uh, the Scuola Grande di San Marco, which was located um, uh, at the back of Canareggio. Uh, Scuola Grande di San Giovanni Evangelista, which was in San Polo. Uh, Scuola Grande di San Rocco, uh, San Polo. Scuola Grande di Carmini, uh, which is close to Santa Maria de, la, de Margarita. Scuola Grande de la Mes Misericordia, which is in Canareggio. Scuola Grande di Santa Maria della Carità, which is today the Academy. Uh, offices in these confraternities were served for the Cicadini, a hereditarily defined caste cast of men below the nobility. Amongst the Cicadini were guild masters who controlled the production process and large numbers of workers. And Pullen suggests that the Scuole Grande provided an outlet for the political ambitions of the Cittadini who were deprived of political office. In addition, the charitable activities that were undertaken by these brotherhoods, including the burial of poor brothers, provision of dowries, and distribution of alms, relieved tension, not only by distributing a portion of the wealth in Venetian society, but also creating a goodwill for every person in society. And the school had these grand halls, which were splendidly decorated by works of art, specifically commissioned for these spaces, such as the uh, paint that I showed at the beginning of the lecture by Gentile Bellini. There were, of course, a smaller school as well, which were for the tradesmen. Uh, and the organization of a large portion of the Venetian populace into guilds was another factor that some uh, uh, scholars suggest was contributing to the Venetian stability. And McKinney suggests that by the middle of the 14th century, there were more than 50 guilds, which on the surface at least would appear to have presented an ideal focus for the populace aspirations. In the census of 1563, some 120,000 people were in a population of about 170,000 people were described as artisans and their families. In the picture of Venice provided by these approaches, socioeconomic factors, myth-making practices, assume practice, primacy, and obscure how these practices are embedded in the urban complex. Uh, and if Venice reveals itself as a physical, as a social, and as a mythical city, what is missing from these accounts regarding the stability of Venice is the spatial factor, how the matrix of social and myth-making structures were inscribed or even generated through spatial practice. So this brings us to these key questions. What were the spatial mechanisms through which the city was generated? If Venice and its myth has been described as socioeconomic structures, how can they also be defined as spatial phenomena? How did space help to define the dominant forces in society and economy? How can we regulate urban form to the relate urban form to the socioeconomic governance? So the presentation has three, has three main parts. First, I will start, I will focus on the city, the spatial and social networks of the city. Then I will focus on the state. And uh, uh, when I say the state, I mean the planned interventions of the state in the Piazza and the Basin of San Marco. And finally, a small part at the end is about speculation regarding contemporary city, although the leap between the pre-industrial city uh, of Venice and the contemporary situation is huge, but we can always speculate. 
So the origins of Venice were in the archipelago of island communities, <clears throat> which after a long process of land reclamation were joined collectively to form the compact city. And if we analyze the pedestrian networks of Venice, we see that the island squares, which we see here, <clears throat> with their churches and the towers, the well heads for water collection, which were located at the center squares, <clears throat> the steps connecting with the canal and the bridges linking with the neighboring islands are interconnected through a pervasive network of choice at all scales. A property which in network theory is called between a centrality and accounts for through movement, all the paths that are most frequently used in order to move between all pairs of origins and destinations. And this is something that we can observe in previous maps of Venice as well, although it gets accentuated with time. The pervasive centrality of these squares indicates that they are the nodes at the intersection of the two infrastructures, the street network and the canal network. And this is confirmed if we analyze the two networks combined um, at the points where they are linked through steps and we disconnect them through uh, at the points where the bridges uh, connect the islands with each other. And this makes sense as initially squares had to be directly serviced by boat. We have to imagine Venice long uh, time back before the bridges connected the islands. Communication between the islands were happening by boats. Gradually as the um, islands started gaining wealth and they reclaimed land uh, collectively producing the compact city, the bridges were built and they were built in a way that they were joining the squares with each other. Squares then became interconnected by both water and land, facilitating the unloading and the distribution of merchandise and people. And this property lead, reveals not only a pattern of urban growth, but also a social and political system. And the squares of Venice were the social nuclei of semi-autonomous communities since early times, gradually coalescing to produce the Venetian commune out of multiple interconnected centralities. If in the previous diagrams, choice or between centrality, this is the logic which draws the development of the city <clears throat> as distributed into the many parochial centers. This measure, the measure of integration or closeness centrality as it is known in network theory, indicating how its space features as a destination, shows that Venice had two major nuclei, the Rialto and the Piazza San Marco. The former was the major trading center, as I explained yeah. earlier, while the latter was the religious and ceremonial core of the city. The patricians had public office as well as trading posts in the Rialto in the warehouse and in, in the warehouse. But equally significant to this was another characteristic. Up to 1297, where the legislation regarding who can join the patrician class changes, the class closes, and then the right to join it becomes hereditary, so class stratification is established at that time, uh, patricians and Populani did not have rigid social ties, and they did not live in concentrated geographical locations. They moved, as Danny Romanos explains in his book Patricians and Populani, in a variety of intersecting social networks, and their location patterns indicate physical dispersion. They were spread throughout the city. Venice's palaces served two distinct yet complementary functions. There were family residences at the upper levels and there were trading headquarters at the ground floor for the ruling class of the Republic. There was a courtyard with an external staircase which led to the piano nobile of the family quarters on the first floor. And then there was a courtyard and, and, the front of the palace was a waterfront key and a gate, uh, which led to the central hall flanked by offices and storerooms. As the commercial premises and the dominant typology in the city, the palace houses were an instance of collectively produced infrastructures. This meant a water gate from a canal and a secondary entrance from a canal or campo. And if the campo with the church and the wellhead were the center of the neighborhood of the parish or the contrata as it was known in Venice, 
the palace with its dual entrance from a canal and a street combine the trading and the domestic world of the nobility. That is the dual association with the government and the palace. So it was a sort of um, dual identity that the palaces had, both socially and specially. While being geographically dispersed, the palaces had a strategic relationship with the squares. So what we see here is that 90% of the palaces are places that are less than 50 meters distance from the squares. And here we see that the large majority are in locations that are less than 50 meters distance from the canal structure. So like the squares, the palaces form the points of overlap between the foreground network of the canals and the background network of the streets. As I was saying before, they were interfacing the world of the patricians with the world of the pirates. The spatial measures of choice and integration therefore express two powerful dualities of the social fabric. First, the twofold identity of the aristocratic class as merchant officials promoting republicanism within their own class, but also social hierarchy for the entire society. And second, parochial identities of the island communities and civic identity of the station of the public. So Venice was as much the outcome of the distributed network of urban elements as of the hierarchical difference of the two urban centers, the Rialto and the Piazza San Marco from the rest of the islands. And with time, social organizations shifted from the parishes and the spontaneous production of space, that collective spontaneous production of space, to central administration. This transformation was in effect a superimposition, suppressing the local communities, but in a way which ensured the mitigation of social conflict. And legends and myths about the origin of the city were also appropriated by the Venetian humanists, as I was saying before, forging the myth of Venice, a collection of beliefs and official histories that described Venice as the most serene republic. This was in effect about institutional, social, and political stability. What about the organization of guilds? There were plenty of statutes, regulations, and restrictions to regulate supply, production, and marketing. Responsibility for enforcement lay with guilds officers. Officers, their election and their duties occupy a large proportion of the statutes, reflecting the importance of the guild as a means of political control and social institution. The chief officer was the warden, the Gastaldo, uh, who ele was elected every year and was expected to have resided in Venice for 20 years. He was paid by the members' contributions. A committee was elected alongside him, and the Gastaldo was responsible to the magistrates rather than to the members. So that gives us an understanding of how the uh, governance structure of the guilds uh, was uh, operating. The guild structure also found for women uh, and not just wives. They were to be found in textile and clothing trades, fustian weavers, cob makers, capers, tailors, and second hand dealers. And immigrants were also allowed to join the guilds, and very quickly after they have arrived in Venice, more or less in a week, and they have to join in a scuola as well. In many industries, there was a community of interest between the merchants, the patricians, who imported raw materials, and ma the masters, who had workshops and hired workmen. There was also a marked difference in the status and economic interest of masters and workers. So there was social stratification inside the guild as well. The owner of a glass furnace, the draper with the wool to be processed and the furrier with a contract to fill had very different interests from the workers that were hired to work for them. The interests of the employers were often more closely associated with those of the merchants those of the workers. did not represent equally the interest of markers and workers. Workers had little more than a nominal voice in most guilds, and in some guilds they didn't even have a vote. Many guilds were controlled by the master who manipulated elections, restricted entry, and controlled retailing. And many guilds were hierarchic or even oligarchic institutions. 
they were responsible to the justiciary vecchi, the magistrates or the patricians whose office were situated here in the Piazza San Marco. And they came from the people that had high office and power. Uh, the Justicia Vecchia acquired important police functions, articulating state laws that bound the guilds to the will of the state. This may have helped to prepare the way for the closing of the Great Council, the Serata, in 1297, which restricted membership to the patriciate. The guilds had the obligation to work for the state, make gifts of goods and money to the Dutch. In the 17th century, they were even drafted as horsemen yeah, and contributed money to the fleet. The guild was allowed to assemble twice a year. Other assemblies required the formal permission of the magistrates. Uh, guildsmen had to give an oath to abide by the guild regulations, which by the 1270s had become an oath of allegiance to the state. No guildsman was to engage in anti-state activities and had to swear not to form any organization or company or armed band conspiracy by oath, bond or any other sworn commitment against the honor of the Dodge and his council, the commune of the Venetians or against any other person. And the oaths were administered by the magistrates, not by guild officers, which enabled the state to deny guildsmen the possibility of organizing political opposition. There were positive aspects, though, and in the interest of the rulers, it was of rulers of Venice to permit, even to promote and encourage the formation of guilds. The arti fulfilled important function in economic and social life without threatening the interests of the ruling class. In addition, there were important compensations for guildsmen in terms of the legal principles which the statutes embodied, especially they had accessibility to courts of appeal. Examining commercial and residential patterns of the guilds is essential in order to understand the rhythms of life and the trips that people took between home and work. And what I have circled here are the three main market areas where the products were sold. So it wasn't just the Rialto, but it was also the area of Santa Maria di Apostoli, San Polo, uh, San Giacomo de Lorio, and Santa Maria Formosa. Every guild had a or a street. They also had market stores in the Rialto, which were allocated by the magistrates. Um, they would exchange wares there and we would keep an, keep an eye at the competitors. There were some concentrations of guilds in terms of production in certain areas, such as in the Arsenale, in this area. Uh, these um, uh, guilds were called the Arsenalotti that were working in, in the Arsenale. And they were not a poor class of guilds, they were actually almost a nobility guild. The fishermen on the other side of uh, Venice, um, uh, the Nicolotti, uh, the glass makers in Murano, which was an island on the north of Venice. The tanners were located in the Judeca. They were previously located in Venice, but gradually for health reasons, they were sent to the Judeca and so on. We see other concentrations as well, like the granaries, which were located here. The masters who were shop owners were occupied and occupying a very densely populated area that was joining the Rialto with the Piazza San Marco. But we also see some other posts of the mercers in other parts of Venice. There were bakers that were living in every part of the city. There were several coopers that lived in the parish of San Cancian near the Alto, but also in other parts of the city. And the rope makers also were dispersed throughout Venice's parishes. Another category that lived in many parishes were the fouriers. And here we see that uh, 21 parishes were housing uh, the guild of Fourier, people uh, for, that belong in the guild of fouriers. Another factor that was related to space-time rhythms in the guilds was the Scuole Grandi and the Scuole Piccole. And like the palaces that constituted bridges between the noble group, the parishioners and the popolani, the institutions channeled the aspirations of the middle class and mediated between the wealthy and the poorer classes. With the exceptions of the Scuole Grandi that had their impressive premises in different parts of the city, brotherhoods were located also in parish churches where they maintained many altars. There were many cases where more than one scuola was situated 
in the same church or campo, rich in white and spheres than the neighborhood. Their geographical location was associated with the patron saint and played a crucial role in the creation and maintenance of identity. But at the same time, through the orientation and location of certain scuole close to major arteries, as we see here in the, those represented in the, red, in the warm colors, the Brotherhood established association with large scale movement, diverse social groups and special practice. And if the palaces unraveled complex associations between large scale commerce, central administration, and the locality, the school added to the interlocking of scales and solidarities. They strengthened the dual orientation of parishes towards a particular locality and towards the institutional superstructures of, of society. It is important as well to be aware of the fact that school and art consisted of diverse participation, as this table shows. They chose four school and the composition consisted of nobles, priests, barbers, surgeons, dentists, and so on, without any one of these groups forming the largest representation. And this diversification of occupation, the lack of correspondence between the residential patterns, commercial patterns, and social patterns, shows that the Venetians mix with each other across classes and scales. These patterns seem to have enabled diverse networks of communication, among the masters, the guilds, the merchant nobles. The pervasive centrality of squares and the global centrality of the piazza and the rialto saw that island communities shared the formation of both the foreground and the background networks, both the canal and the street networks. They also indicate that what the squares were to the islands, the rialto and the San Marco were to Venice as a whole. Finally, they revealed the key role of the patrician society the church and these professional institutions in shaping the city. And these institutions collectively constructed through the interrelationships of water and land, the geography of the parishes, the background of the city, and the major structure of the city as a whole, which is the foreground. And to explore the variables of the parish and the city as a whole, to see how much they contributed to the structure of the city, um, we can uh, perhaps use a bit of a deductive technique uh, and a reductive one, representing the special values of the urban networks using these four pointed star models. The points on the vertical axis are the mean choice value and the mean integration value. Remember I showed you two values, choice that captures through movement in the network and integration that captures to movement, the capacity of a particular element to attract movement to itself. Uh, the left and right points of the figure here are the maximum values of these measures respectively. And here we see a plot of mean and maximum values of choice and integration using the diamond for the system of canals, uh, streets, canal and streets intersections, and canal and street unlinked at bridges and linked through steps. And here are all the systems together in terms of global measures and local measures, because the analysis, which is a space index analysis, as would have said when I presented the two measures, uh, calculates properties, calculates these values, both at the global scale of the city as a whole, and then at various levels, uh, which, can, uh, which are considered as local scale. When we put Venice into a diagram that um, shows us uh, the same measures for um, uh, 44 other cities, which are analyzed by um, my colleagues at the Bartlett, we see that Venice is 41st. So it's not performing really well in terms of the strength of these values. And of course, we all know it's a very labyrinthine city. This doesn't mean that it is a difficult uh, city to navigate once you know it. Um, uh, it is close to other cities like Antwerp, Rio de Janeiro, Bath, Gouda, Hamedan, Ahmedabad, Sao Paulo, Nicosia, and Siraz. But we also see something else. In a canal system, which is shown here in blue, uh, what we have, we have the canal system is stronger in terms of the mean value rather than the maximum value. And finally, in the combined canal and street system, pedestrian system, which is the green uh, shape, we see almost an equal, um, a, a perfect diamond shape. 
showing that all the values have more or less equal um, strength. So that means that there is a minimized difference between the foreground and the background. And equalizing the potential of the network to attract movement and structure routes throughout the system. In the sense, Venice doesn't have these big avenues that other cities have. There, there is not a great difference between elements that carry a strength in the system as a whole and elements that doesn't carry, do not carry such a strength and they form the background structure or the residential structure. More or less the values are the same. This equalization of values shows that the residential areas from parishes are just as strong as the foreground network that structures global scale movement. So Venice's parcel networks were decentralized and distributed. The outcome of bottom-up action where no element or node monopolizes control. This characteristic goes hand in hand with the coupling of identities, the interlocking of solidarities and the dispersion of social classes. The special characteristics, the political and commercial interests of the Venetian oligarchy, which invested in equality of power among the peer group, the white participation of residents in the corporate bodies, and finally the spatial dispersion of social groups reveal a collaboration between public and private interests, distributing to every canal, street and side, equal rights of access. I will now move to discuss the configuration of the Piazza Marco in the 16th century. This is a time of political um, change in Venice. Uh, we need to take into account that the circumnavigation of Africa has taken place, which caused the collapse of the markets in Rialto and really changed the geopolitical position of Venice uh, in terms of um, worldwide trade. Um, what happens at that point is that the city decides to invest in its own public spaces and anchorize them. We see that in many powers, when powers, when certain um, leading powers um, are diminished, a great deal of emphasis goes on to symbolic factors, uh, moving away from the instrumental operation of uh, an empire, a maritime empire, onto its symbolic aggrandization. So the, at that time, it's the time where the Renaissance architecture uh, is flourishing in other Italian cities. It is a little bit late in terms of its arrival in Venice, but it arrives with uh, architects such as Sansovino and Palladio. Sansovino became the master, um, the proto in Venice and was responsible for the management of the structures in the Piazza San Marco. Uh, looking at the Piazza and the Piazzetta, we see that they are highly accessible areas. I've highlighted here the strongest elements in terms of the values. And we see how they cover the Piazza and they link with uh, the Arsenale on one side, the Rialto, and then of course, this is uh, Venice in contemporary times, the uh, Academia Bridge uh, on the other side. And how did the urban renovation in the 16th century respond to these properties that the Piazza San Marco had? I explored, uh, I will explore this. I have highlighted here the major structures in the Piazza San Marco. I assume that most of you have visited Venice. And if you haven't visited Venice, you know, the Ducal Palace, the Basilica, the Orologio, which was built in the previous century, the 15th century, to mark the entrance to the shopping district, the dense shopping district that would lead into the Rialto. And then the Biblioteca Marciana and the Mint, which are built by, the, by Sansovino. The reconfiguration um, uh, concerned an enlargement of the piazza, the um, uh, stepping forward or backward, uh, depending on where you're looking at it, of the, this building light, line to build, to free the bell tower uh, and link, ma link ma in a much better way the piazzetta here with the piazza. The Piazzetta was the political part of the Piazza San Marco, whereas the Piazza facing the Basilica was more of the religious part. I explore this by looking at the visibility structure of the Piazza, by doing a similar analysis that looks at um, superimposes a grid structure on top of the layout and looks at all the visual connections of every grid unit with every other grid unit. Um, 
Uh, there is also that in the Sansovino scheme, visual integration spreads from the space in front of the basilica to the entire layout. Improving the visual connections between the piazza and the piazzetta, if we compare the 15th century layout with the 16th century, we see how the red warm colors really establish better links between the two parts of the complex in the Piazza San Marco. Uh, so by improving these links between the two spaces, he expressed the union of religious and political life. He created a better integration between these two parts. And his efforts to unify existing elements into the new scheme demonstrated for integration between the aesthetic treatment of buildings as the continuous loggia that travels all around the piazza, which uh, Sansovino really um, uh, strengthened, reinforced, and the placement of archways at the intersection of important axes, such as the Orologio, which was located uh, here at the intersection where the Merceria um, meets the entrance to the Piazza San Marco. And this is strikingly revealed through a powerful axial link that is clearly distinguished by this strong red color, emerges from the Merceria through the central archway of the Orologio and thrusts diagonally through the, um, the, the, the piazza um, towards the columns of justice. These are the two columns that are located here at the front. They form a kind of a gate that uh, all the dignitaries and the visitors that would approach Venice naturally through uh, the um, Adriatic, coming I mean, by boat through the Adriatic, would face as they would come to the city. So the, the, the line asserts the north-south distribution of, inter, of, uh, of integration, which I described in the analysis of the city as a whole, uh, that joins the piazza and the Rialto. And the consonance between the properties of the piazza and those of the city as a whole shows the strong role of the piazza in this particular axial link across all scales of the analysis. What's interesting is if we look at the Jacobo de Barbaris map, the axis has geometric definition through the lines that join the mythological features. In the plaza, piazza, it has architectural definition through significant buildings. Emerging from the collective unconscious efforts that built Venice over time um, and expressing the structure that people would really get to know by working and moving inside the city over time. The Merceria line articulates the subconscious relationship between architecture, the unconscious city, and the viewer. So Sansovino sees the urban properties of Venice as they had developed through the multiple actions of people over time and used classical architecture to express the city state in the Republic. And it is this interweaving of the urban structure crafted by many hands with the architectural structure made by fewer hands that defines the intersection of humanist architecture with the city and urban design. If we look at the piazza and the piazzetta from the molo, molo the molo is the, uh, this part of, the, of Venice here. If we look at it from the water, yeah, we see a close connection between the piazza and Serlio's tragic scene. Serlio interpreted three typical scenes of antiquity as exercises of verbal perspective. The tragic scene here on the left, which is uh, what the Piazza San Marco imitated, and San Sovino was a friend of Serlio, so he knew the three scenes, def were defined by palace facades, corresponded to the administrative use of space, and they were all dignified buildings, quite regular, aligned, and so on. The comic scene, on the other hand, consisted of irregular buildings that were jagged, and they were coming in and out uh, of the building line. And there were the everyday spaces. This was the everyday space of markets uh, where merchants would operate. And the satiric scene uh, was associated with the uncultivated nature. The definition of the piazza as a tragic scene is evident in Sansovino's effort to clear away the shacks of butchers, cheese and salami sellers who had infested the area, elevating the piazza from the comic scene as a, a, a scene of markets and guilds and cinema festivals to a tragified and um, cleared setting. And closely associated with this was a decree that eliminated the slaughtering of bulls and pigs by the crowds during carnival, 
replacing popular with noble entertainments. And the concentration of state ceremonies in this space. In medieval Venice, a ritual was the result of popular myth-making and was organized by the parish islands and by the guilds. In the 16th century, parochial rituals were decreased in number while the island communities were suppressed so that attention could turn to civic ritual in the Piazza San Marco. A civic ritual was organized by the state. There is an increase in the number of positions, public official positions that people hold in order to organize these rituals, to organize the festivities, became, uh, and became hierarchical. With the dots at the center, I'm showing here out of the, the entire depiction. Uh, in front of the dodge marched the guilds, and behind the dodge were the patricians, reflecting the hierarchical structure of society. So the emergence of architecture as liberal art and legitimate source of urban management coincides with theatrical civic ritual and official historiography by the Venetian elite who, con who contributed to the myth of Venice as the most serene republic. From that moment on, architecture and the city are no longer part of the same continuum. They develop along paths that remain paradoxically distinct and intertwined. Architecture in a way is an elite discipline and it was supported by the elite um, of these city-states. Built at the end of the 16th century, Palladio's churches completed through geometrical alignment from the relationship, the transformation of the piazza and the basin into an aquatic theater. San Giorgio Maggiore, for example, which is situated here, which is what we see as we emerged under the arch of the Orologio and we enter the piazza, the piazza um, is on the extension of the Merceria line that links with the Rialto, the extension of this line. We encounter here the Barbaris axis extending from the interior of the city to San Giorgio and beyond where the lagoon meets the Adriatic, uniting the marketplaces, the heart of the city where the market is, with the sacred geography inside and outside, the city and the sea, civic identity and parochial identity, the anonymous production of Venice and the conscious appropriation of the city to celebrate the state and the republic. In the annual festivities, the Rendetore, uh, who, which was the other uh, church built by Palladio, which is uh, here, and Santa Maria della Salute, which was built uh, some years later, which is located here and presides over the entrance to the Grand Canal, the Venetians crossed the water through, even today, uh, uh, through temporary causeways from the Piazzetta to the Zavan Islands. And seen from distance across the water, the churches in the early days of the archipelago would offer sure anchorage for sailors under the protection of the Paris Saint. Founded on maritime enterprise, Venice's islands had old associations with navigational practices guided by churches that were sacralizing its waters through loci sancti. And toponymy bears witness to this process as Venice's campi are named after the saints, while portal uh, maps linking rose compasses with navigational lines must express for early Venetians a waterborne network of sacred sites. So if the Merceria, San Giorgio link, um, which uh, moves from Rialto through the Orologio, through Piazza San Marco down to San Giorgio, translated the strategic connection between the commercial nucleus and the religious center of Venice, the network of monuments in the basin, the ones that Palladio built and other architects, including the Santa Maria de la Salute, grafted onto the aquatic landscape, the pervasive centrality of the churches and the squares in the city, as well as the old practices of navigation and urban ritual. So the city of Venice was the outcome of evolutionary urban development, myth-making, symbolism and ritual. Along with the gradual melding of islands, canals, squares and streets, the Venetians were developing their history and the foundations of the city based on these professional practices and ritual processions. Ritual was the creation of Venice, uniting urban sites, myth and informal theater in a coherent structure of space and place. And it was also given a footing to 
the guilds in terms of participating in the major uh, events that were uh, celebrated in the city. The Venetian humanists converted a collection, a irregular collection of folk beliefs into official historiography through political and mythological interpretation of the city. However, they did not describe the daily practices, um, particularly the ritual processes, knowing that people knew them because they were immersed in the city and they knew them based on their city customs since they were born. They did not need comprehensive descriptions or written records. The space of the city was a matter of everyday use, of everyday practice. It was a matter of memory rather than writing. This is what characterized the writing and drawing because we have the first um, architectural treatises appearing at the time, like Serio's book with the drawings and the descriptions. Um, urban space was related to movement, theatrical performance, um, uh, professional practices, commercial practices, and their sequence. And the significance was based on this everyday practice rather than specific guidelines, such as go to this place or follow this route or pass through this area or perform such and such activities and ritual functions, uh, actions. And in the hands of the governing authorities, architecture and civic ritual were the means of appropriating their conscious production of the city's networks and suppressing the local histories and customs in order to exalt the state and the republic. The urban landscape as a collective production has remained since then in the blind spot of conscious design rooted in the scenographic aesthetic understanding of space that leaves the significance of the notion. The space of the city did not have, have uh, up until recently, the means for being represented, recorded and transcribed. What cannot be recorded, according to Mario Carpo, cannot be transmitted, gradually leading to the rift between architecture and the city, representation and spatial practice. Now we spent the majority of this presentation talking about the creative dynamic of an early industrial city. And it is difficult to compare this type of city with contemporary cities. So transposing the historical city of the guilds into the concept of guilds of digital communication networks today is a huge leap. However, one thing is certain. Where previously everything that transpired in the city evaporated in the moment it happened, this will never happen now. For most people in Venice, daily life buying the transactional value of things and experiential value of things in a seamless way. By that, I mean they engage with market values and profit making, as well as with collectively shared experiential values of society, mediated through their institutions and organizations. In contrast, all of the rhythms and processes in the city are now captured by mobile devices, networks and data, retained for inspection, for analysis, for a prediction and for projections. We can now perceive the trading and other rhythms of the city from the multiple daily orbits our cell phones describe. So we have the smartphone, the internet of things, we have virtual reality, augmented reality, we have digital fabrication, we have cryptocurrency, algorithms, machine learning, automation, artificial intelligence, and all these are changing our economies, our lives, our cities, and our societies irreversibly. But more importantly, network digital information technology has become the dominant mode through which we experience our everyday life. And the role of a few companies like Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook that strive for vertical integration and the role of the state get intensified but as Adam Greenfield explains, it is not all one-way traffic. Citizens can now command many of the same capabilities and are gazing right back upon this surveillance. At the same time, pervasive network technology generates contrasting potentials. As Antoine Picon explains in his book, Smart Cities, on the one hand, there is this neo-cybernetic ambition to steer the city in the most optimized way, and on the other, there is the logic of bottom-up power, agency, and cooperation. And for PICON, smart cities through the digital capabilities have emphasized both the local 
and a global idea of power in space. And this is our challenge. Uh, given the role of all these technologies and the influence of people that control them, how different are they from the ecosystem of social and economic networks emerging through the guilds and the cooperation of public and private interests they sustained in Venice? What governance system do we now need, which is cohesively integrated into the body politic as an alternative to a placeless, technologically enabled, all powerful network of platforms governed by robots? And our challenge is, do we want to enable a society or do we have something else in mind? And is there anybody asking us anyway? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Tara, for such a wonderful presentation and uh, such a, like a great approach for us to kind of unpack this multi-layered city, uh, which is uh, Venice. Uh, please, if anyone has a question, please post them uh, in the chat and uh, we will address them. Uh, I guess I guess I can start with the question I have in mind, which is like, so uh, I've got the chance to also explore the book, uh, your book on Venus, and then uh, I've, uh, and now after seeing your presentation, so you say in your book that, uh, you know, Venus is not the, the result of uh, preconceived ideals, but it's actually the product of social, uh, of its social networks. Uh, and then when we look at some of examples uh, from your presentation, uh, like the, the Serelio, uh, it looks like there was kind of, and based on the myth and uh, and all of these uh, are were at play, we kind of see there is a certain imagery or something that kind of developed and shaped the city regardless of these networks. I don't know if, if, uh, if you have anything in mind, it looks like even the political parties or like the, the ruling uh, parties also had a saying in how to shape the city. And there was a fixed imagery. Yes, exactly. This is what the Renaissance project was. It was yeah. a way of reimagining the city as an ancient Roman forum. Mm. Uh, and we see how the Piazza San Marco is reimagined as an urban forum. Um, so uh, they, this, this is a time where um, architects, first of all, become uh, architecture becomes a liberal art and is distinguished from the mechanical arts. Uh, it means that the architect is educated, speaks well, is well dressed and gets distance from the everyday practices of building and constructing the city. Um, reads books, uh, can um, uh, draw, can represent buildings, and lots of them went to Rome to study ancient ruins, and um, they recombined them quite creatively in a way to construct uh, classical buildings and classical urban spaces. And uh, that influence arrived in Venice. It wasn't untroubled though, it wasn't accepted um, uh, openly. It took a long time for Renaissance architecture to reach Venice, and when it arrived, uh, it was there was a very strong dialogue between various factions in Venice that had opposite views. Uh, there was one particular group that believed that Venice's local traditions and uh, multiple um, ways of building and uh, constructing in the city should be retained. It was another group that really aspired to these classical buildings and the two clashed in many ways, mm. in, um, in fascinating ways. It's described by um, Mafredo Tafuri in his book, Venice in the Renaissance, for whoever is interested in understanding uh, that kind of clash between modern architecture, which is what uh, Renaissance architecture was at the time, and then the traditional um, vernacular architecture of Venice. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question now, which is about the proximity to water. So the question is, I wonder if water has symbolic meaning in the Ventian context, if this influence in the architecture uh, so the question ask the person asking studies African history and many coastal communities imbue religious meaning and spiritual power in the waterways. Uh, the water had uh, all kinds of meanings, it had an instrumental meaning in the sense that was the life of Venice. <laughs> yeah, without water, Venice, and without the flow of water in and out of the lagoon, Venice could not survive. 
Um, the symbolic meaning of, of water was very, very strong as well. Uh, the symbolic meaning of uh, Venice as a, a maritime empire was uh, incredibly important. And there were lots of rituals that celebrated water and celebrated uh, Venice's domination of water. So one particular ritual was uh, happening, I think, uh, around the end of August or the middle of August, where the Doge would get on uh, his barge and then um, accompanied by other boats um, would go to the Lido where the lagoon met the Adriatic Sea and he would drop his ring to the sea um, sim symbolically expressing the marriage of Venice to the sea. So we have you, Faye, now our convener would like to ask a question as well. Yeah, yeah, I would like to ask. Uh, there's a, like, also a, like a question in my mind for quite a long time. So about Venice in general, it is uh, like a heavily represented city and with its image being described in many different forms uh, in arts and films, fictions, plays. So uh, how do you think these uh, cultural products uh, help you or help us to understand winners? Or did they contribute in your process of investigation about the city? Uh, that's a good question. My book started from that uh, question in a way that it is the city that has inspired so many artists, so many writers, painters and architects, and um, uh, has led to the production of uh, incredible works of art and works of architecture. Um, uh, there are an essential element of Venice. I think that every expression of a city in art form and in a communally uh, owned art, collectively produced art, which is folk art, etc., not just high art, is very important for the life of a city. Uh, so, for example, in the case of the myth of Venice, the myth of Venice was a translation of legends and myths that uh, uh, the people of Venice have developed about themselves, about the, the foundation, the mythical foundation of the city, uh, this translation on to, happened onto historical uh, historiography, official historiography, uh, which gives you an idea of how important uh, the myths that we construct about our cities and the myths the, the, the way in which these myths fuel works of art and literature are, in, are for, for, for the life of a city. And we know uh, today, if we see a film about Venice or if we see a film about another city or another place, that is going to really result to lots of people going to visit that particular place. So there is always a traffic between expressions of a city to art and then the life that happens in the city. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so we have another question. Hello, Sofia, your book was wonderful. Given the events that happened in 2019, 2020, uh, Aqua and COVID, you name two. What is your greatest hope for a rebirth of Venice? Perhaps to a time similar to when guilds and scholia helped uh, form the social network. Let's see. Oh, yeah, that's a really interesting question. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, the work that I have done is about understanding uh, the, all the factors and all the layers, uh, uh, cultural layers, spatial layers, economic layers, and so on, that gave rise to the city, uh, rather than provide solutions uh, to help uh, Venice come out of the difficult situations that it has found itself today. But perhaps we can learn from the past of Venice. And um, uh, everybody says that uh, Venice needs to open itself again to tourism because uh, this is an important aspect of its survival, but it needs to do it in a different way. Um, uh, there are lots of uh, discussions and debates about the, the big ships, the big, big cruise ships, um, and they have been, which have uh, really created a lot of reactions among the residents, and um, a lot of lobbying, a lot of articles have been written, and a lot of uh, efforts have been um, concentrated towards uh, solving this problem, but unfortunately the governance of the city is not contributing to solving it. So a great deal of change has to come from a cooperation between the public and the private interests. Uh, and we should take into account all these factors, the governance of a city, the spatial networks, the social fabric, spatial fabric, social fabric, 
and the economic metric as well. I don't know if this answers the question, but mm -hmm. perhaps we can start, you know, from one small thing and then hope to make a difference in the others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a wonderful answer, I think. Yeah, especially in the today's context. In your presentation, you mentioned these uh, power patterns in the gills. Yes. And then there are also like a semi-autonomous uh, society in everyday life. So how these two coexist co and balanced in the city? So you mean the power structures in the uh, organization of the guilds? Yes. And then the semi-autonomous uh, patterns in terms of how Venice um, emerged um, and grew to a compact city. Yes. And there was always, um, uh, this is uh, uh, something that the historians really um, uh, engage with, how you actually separate reality from the myth. The myth really presented the city as the Assyrian city as a city that was stable and was not really divided by strong conflict. This does not mean though that there wasn't a struggle and there wasn't a conflict. There were no riots, but there was a struggle. Yeah? Uh, one of the most important struggles is the one that I try to describe between the parishes, which were semi-autonomous communities when they, as, they, as they started, and then the power of the state. The history of Venice is this struggle. And um, it was this duality, yeah, because gradually the city shifted from this um, equally distributed collective form of governance and production to a superimposition and a top down structure. So um, there was concentration of power gradually with time. And this takes its greatest manifestation in the 16th century. Thank you. I don't know if it answers the question, but it was one yes. of the struggles. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sophia, for the lecture. It's been quite enjoyable. I have a quick question regarding the current challenges Venice faces. How do you imagine the uh, traditional urban guilds or traditional guilds within the Venetian context? Um, given the modern changes that Venice is seeing, uh, with regards to a lot of the traditional um, restaurants or hotels being uh, converted by a lot of mainstream and servicing a large scale tourism industry. What's happening is a lot of the trades um, are kind of being displaced. Not only that, you have a lot of the original residents as well uh, being displaced. Um, from your thoughts and research, how do you imagine guilds can play a more contemporary role in trying to reimagine the restaurateurs or the bakers or the cafes and so forth? Um, and, uh, and, and, and kind of demonstrate an authenticity back towards uh, the kind of social, social and commercial structure of Venice. And the second question is more historic, uh, Dr. Sophia, is how have you, based on your research, seen a lot of these guilds connected beyond Venice. So somehow guilds by association within Italy and if not broader to different uh, countries or different geographies perhaps around the Mediterranean basin. Maybe you can comment on that. Okay, yeah, starting with the first question. Um, I think what's, what the local residents and the shop owners and the restaurant owners at the local scale of Venice are experiencing is a gradual displacement. I think that the size of tourism has a lot to, to, uh, to do with that. The management of tourism, the, the, the time frame, the, the, the rhythms, uh, the circles by which these things happen. So with careful re uh, governance and regulation, I believe that people can uh, be encouraged to remain in Venice and not to be pushed out of their neighborhoods and out of their businesses and out of their shops. Um, I don't have specific solutions about that, but I'm sure, I'm positive, and I'm hopeful that it can be done. It is not an impossibility. It just has to do with the fact that the city really assigns to large-scale tourism in the way it does. And of course, there are other challenges like uh, 
People cannot have a car. Yeah, they have they, they park their car in the car park in Venice. And if they want to take the family and go uh, for a, a car drive or a holiday, it is not as easy as when they live in the mainland and they have the car parked outside the home and they put their family in the car and then they drive. But there are lots of other things that Venice offers that can compensate in a way. Yeah. And the guilds are any formats of modern guilds, I mean, of course, reimagined in association through unions and so forth. Do you imagine that playing any role within Venice in the in these challenges? The, yes, the, 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 there is a role that they can play. Uh, I think that they have lots of networks of organization, political, activist, uh, commercial, organizational, and so on. So there is hope. It all depends on how all this can be harnessed thoughtfully um, in a way that uh, the way in which the Venetian state used to do it. They were very thoughtful in terms of how they created that mesh between the various interests, the various social groups, and so on, extremely thoughtful. And that's why it stayed for 1,000 years in a kind of serene existence. Regarding the relationship between trade in Venice, historically, and trade in other cities, um, the things that I have read is that uh, uh, there were a lot of immigrants that were coming from other city states to Venice to work. Uh, immigrants from Italian city-states and immigrants from other um, countries. So there was a Greek community of um, 30,000 people, I think. There was a, a Slavic community, a German community, a Turkish community, and there was a Jewish community as well. Yeah? Uh, now, this, um, there were lots of regulations in the guilds to secure the interests of the guilds and uh, uh, ass assign the, the people that were arriving onto the statues of the guilds. Uh, but there were lots of restrictions as well. So uh, workers in a, in a particular guild or in a particular master were not allowed to actually go and work for another master. So if you read about the there were very, very extensive and precise rules that regulated the prices, the number of days that people could work, they were not allowed to work in festive days. Of course, there was always effort to break the rules so people could gain a competitive advantage, you know, for their uh, um, business in comparison to others, but uh, they could uh, be issued a fine. Uh, so there was a very carefully constructed uh, uh, system of regulations and rules that uh, uh, had to do a lot with struggle and conflict. And as I said, there was hierarchical um, uh, relationships between uh, the people that belonged in the guilds. Um, and there was an oligarchic structure sometimes, uh, but uh, they were keeping that world in coexistence in a way. Uh, we have another question, which is, okay. Uh, so I find the theme of, on guilds and the focus on Venice interesting. Giving also the well-known Venice uh, Binale, uh, one happening this year as well, uh, and this notion of architecture and imaginative inter uh, invention deriving from the area. Do you think the institution of uh, Binale could be seen as a contemporary kind of guild, or could the guilds embody a somewhat a critique regarding this organization, uh, agency, and its relationship to Venice in terms of imaginative invention? Um, the Biennale is um, uh, one of the major avenues for the city, yeah? uh, and uh, in a way, uh, if, see, if the city gave uh, birth to uh, so many manifestations of art and so many artworks, why not having a major uh, art and architecture event in uh, the city of Venice? But uh, the question is uh, whether um, that event can do things for Venice other than the revenue it brings for the six months of the year, uh, addressing some of the problems that Venice faces, uh, are facing, or whether it's just a place for um, a destination for artists or architects or various elites that uh, travel to Venice to enjoy the exhibition and enjoy uh, what the city offers. Um, so I don't know if this answers the question, but I think uh, that particularly in recent, uh, the recent Biennales, the last 10 years, 
and more, try to address problems of global significance. And there is a lot of very interesting work uh, that is exhibited there. Uh, but I think that it will be really fantastic if the Biennale does something for the problems that Venice is facing. Uh, I think uh, one, one question I can ask as well is that how, like at, at this time of, you know, capitalist domination or something like that. And yes, last uh, week from, uh, Camacho's presentation on the, in the context of Portugal, we've seen a lot of how you know coastal areas have been changed and being built through like you know the intervention from a, a top-down approach. How do you think we can increase uh, a bottom-up approach in in a context like Venice, or do you think there is like uh, limitations imposed by capitalism through such an approach, or? Oh, that's a very, very difficult <laughs> planning. Yeah, I mean, because, so, because honestly, so like in the last uh, two lectures with the Camacho and Sinedad, uh, you know, a small dialogue on capitalism and its impact on urban guilds have kind of emerged. So we, we kind of thought if you have any like ideas on, uh, on that or do, do you see it as a problem? And if so, how do you think you can go around it or? Uh, it has to do a lot with uh, um, the, uh, again, the cooperation between private and public interests and the degrees of control and regulation that we have, we can have mm -hmm. from um, organizations uh, such as councils and then participation uh, by citizens as well. So I am hopeful that these things can be achieved. Uh, it has to do with larger issues that have to do with the economy, how the economy is organized as mm -hmm. well. So I do agree that capitalism has a huge impact mm -hmm. and that um, uh, one particular aspect of that is who owns the land as well mm -hmm. and how land ownership is structured and how it's administered, uh, how the economics of land um, is, is structured. And um, in order to be able to address, I believe issues like that, we've got to focus on that. So for example, uh, huge inequalities uh, are directly related with uh, land economics in particularly um, residential land economics. Mm. Um, but if we live in a society where uh, our interest is in our immediate gratification and um, our desires are gratified immediately, and we fail to understand the structures of economy, the structures uh, that produce cities, the structures that regulate cities and uh, uh, the economic interests and struggles, I think we are going to continue experiencing uh, the problems that uh, cities like Venice experience. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if you have any more questions. Uh... I think we have a few minutes if we can, if we have any. Um, uh, one final comment maybe from my side, Dr. Sophia. The, one of the interesting facts is, I know that there's a lot of traditional hotels that are quite ample in Venice. They're not considered the major stars, whether it's two, three, four star hotels. Uh, I see another crisis coming uh, about with this whole notion of a shared economy as well. We've talked briefly about displacement. Um, I mean, there are a lot of people mostly going to Venice, not exclusively for visiting, but some go to the Foscaria to study, some go for research, of course, the Biennale and so forth. And somehow the economy is peripheral and supportive through this. Um, uh, these very Venetian kind of service providers. I see this almost moving towards a new scale, which is the Airbnb sense, where a lot of these major buildings, traditional buildings, are somehow now being occupied on many fronts. Maybe you can comment a little bit about that, uh, and I'd like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, the yeah. How we can touch on guilds briefly on a modern or contemporary sense. Uh, the Airbnb is a contemporary phenomenon that is changing the the type of life in many uh, European cities and cities around the world. Um, so from personal experiences, um, from visiting cities like Barcelona or Venice, when I used to visit them 20 years ago before Airbnb, and in spite of the large influx of um, tourism in the cities, 
there was still a great deal of local identity. And when you would uh, visit the centers, you would uh, be aware of locals living in the centers. Uh, when I visited them recently, visited Barcelona recently, it wasn't that recently, I think probably four years ago, I was completely shocked because there had been a large year difference between my last visit and that visit. I was completely shocked by the change in the demographic. It was like being in a big airport, basically, um, which was full of restaurants um, on every <laughs> corner. And I could not sense uh, the presence of locals at all. I could see people of diverse origin. I mean, this, of course, um, creates a sense of cosmopolitanism and brings a lot of uh, um, uh, revenue to the city. And it's also good for the, um, uh, the income generation strategies for, for the locals, but it really threatens cities in a big way. So cities like Barcelona have imposed limits uh, in terms of the amount of time that people can uh, use their residences as Airbnb. So there can be solutions that can, again, balance the need for income generation for, from this kind of distributed economies, but at the same time, um, the diverse and um, um, the diverse operation of the city from the point of view of all these other aspects that are important by displacement and so on. Uh, I think I think that brings our session to to an end. Uh, on behalf of uh, my co-conveners and everyone, we would like to thank you for such a wonderful and uh, inspiring presentation, uh, Dr. Sarah. And then, as she said, uh, her book, The Venice Variations, is available online. If anyone wants to uh, explore more, uh, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. We really enjoyed the session. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. I thank enjoyed you. it with you. And thank you for yeah, the great yeah. questions. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of food for thought. Yeah, thank you very much. So our next session uh, will be on Friday. We'll be joined by architect Christophe Bodo to talk to us about the work of the Aga Khan Trust for Culture in Mali. So we'll hope also to see you then. Uh, thank you again, uh, Professor. Uh, thank you. Bye, everyone.